It got a little crazy, and um, I had to be snuck in and out of restaurants and theaters and so forth. So I had an invitation to go. Some of you probably heard me tell this story before, but uh, uh, bear with me. Uh, I had an invitation to go to speak at a college in Billings, Montana. And were you there? <laughs> it was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, I, I decided to go because I thought it would be peaceful, get away from Hollywood. And, uh, and I went to Billings, Montana to speak at this college. And I, I went to the airport. They drove me to a, a local motel. And I, I was in the room five minutes unpacking on the phone rang. I couldn't imagine who could be calling me. Uh, uh, what are you doing? Sneak up over there, it doesn't have you, it just says your name. Sneak right in on me. <laughs> so, uh, the phone rang and I picked it up and they answered it, hello. And a young female voice said, hi, is this Mr. Nemo? And I said, yes, it is. Oh, oh my God, oh! Oh, I can't believe it, oh, wow, I, oh yeah, hi. such big Star Trek fans. I said, who are you? <laughs> she said, my name is Sally. I said, where are you calling me from? She said, St. Louis. <laughs> How did you find me? She said, I heard they're going to be speaking at Billings and I called all the hotels and motels. There's only three. <laughs> Sally, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the call. I, there are some people waiting for me. And I, I, I've got to go now, so goodbye and keep watching the show. And thank you very much on that. On that. I, I finished packing. I was heading for the door. Not three minutes later, the phone rang again. I picked it up. Another female went, Oh, hi, is this Mr. Nimoy? Yes. Oh, wow, I got him. I got him on the phone. I got him. Who are you? My name is Mary. Mary, where are you calling me from? She said, Denver. <laughs> Mary, how did you find me? She said, my friend Sally called me from St. Louis. <laughs> that was great, that was great. Uh, I grew up in Boston in a, a tenement neighborhood. And, uh, and this is, uh, this thing is working. Yeah, no. that's, uh, that's the front of the building, where I grew up, and the lady on the, on the left, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> the lady on the left is my grandmother, and uh, I lived in that building for, eight, for the first 18 years of my life, and uh, these were some of the guys I used to hang around with on the, on the corner. Um, you had to have a white shirt to be in this gang. <laughs> that's me on the, on the far left. Um, I was, I was lucky to grow up in Boston. It's a great city. Uh, lots of academia and uh, lots of museums and a lot of art, theaters and music and what have you. And we, uh, very close to where I lived, about two blocks away, there was what we call a settlement house. Five-story brick building with all kinds of classes uh, designed for immigrants. To, uh, it was built in the 1910, 1520s. Uh, immigrant people could go there to learn various things they needed to learn, including English classes, because most of the immigrants spoke Italian or, or Yiddish or various foreign languages. And um, they had a theater. They had a sports program and a science program, but they also had a beautiful little theater. And I, I first stepped out on that stage when I was eight years old in a, uh, in a production of Hansel and Gretel, and I played Hansel. And this theater had a beautiful um, um, embroidered curtain, and it was a, a forest scene. And at the bottom, in, in very beautiful Gothic letters, it said, Act where your part, there all honor lies. And I took that very seriously. I thought, hey, that's very important to, to, do, honorable, to do an honorable job in, in, in the part that you play. So it made an impression on me. And I, I continued to do children's theater there until when I was 17, I was cast for the first time in a, a, an adult production of a play called Awaken Sick. This was a play about a Jewish family in the Bronx, very much like my own Jewish family in Boston. There were three generations living in an apartment together, the grandparents, parents, and kids. And in this play, I'm playing the 17-year-old juvenile. 
I was 17 myself, so I really very strongly identified with the character. And this kid in the play was having the same concern that I was having. How do you, how do you find out who you're supposed to be in the world? How do you find the right job for yourself? How do you go to the right school? How do you find the right girl for yourself? How, how do you build a life? And this kid was going through these issues, and so was I. And I thought, if I could do this kind of work for the rest of my life, helping people to understand their lives, illuminating an audiences, illuminating lives of people in the audience, I would consider it very important work, and I would consider myself blessed to be able to do that. So I decided to be an actor. And I went home and I said that to my folks, I'm going to be an actor. Well, <laughs> it didn't go down so great. You know? <laughs> my parents were immigrants from Russia, my father was a barber, decent guy, and, and, and on his feet and cut hair for maybe 65 or 70 years of his life, and uh, worked hard, very unsophisticated. I said, Dad, I'm going to be an actor. He said, you'll be hanging around with gypsies and vagabonds. <laughs> I thought, OK. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it has to be. You know? And then he gave me the only advice my dad ever gave me. He was very serious. He said, learn to play the accordion. <laughs> <laughs> you can always make a living with an accordion. <laughs> I didn't take his advice. Sure my dad plays the accordion. The last movie that I saw before I left Los Angeles, to move to California, the last movie I saw was Shakespeare's Henry V, directed by and starring Laurence Olivier, considered the greatest actor of our generation. <laughs> wonderful movie, wonderful movie. And uh, there comes a moment in the movie where Henry is uh, with his troops. They're about to go into battle tomorrow morning. It's the night time. Tomorrow morning, they're going to fight the French. And they're vastly outnumbered. The French have a lot more soldiers than the English army does. Henry's concerned about the emotional condition of his troops, so he goes out in disguise, kind of put it, like Spock did in Star Trek III, and, uh, and he goes out amongst the troops to listen to what they're talking about. And he hears somebody say, I wish we had more men. And he says, what's he that wishes so, my, my cousin? Westmoreland? Nay, nay, cousin, he says, wish not one man more. If we are marked to die, we are now to do our country loss. But if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. And I got a chill when I heard that. I said, wow, there's that word again. Then he goes on to say, by Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things grow not in my desire. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. I took that very seriously. I thought honor is going to be an important thing in my life. I've got to pay attention to that. It means something to me. There's a reason it keeps coming at me like this. And I took that in and held it. So in search of honor, I got on a train. I went to California to that great citadel of honor known as Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I got off the train, I moved into a rooming house, got myself some 8 by 10 glossy photographs, went up and down Sunset Strip where all the agencies were, knocking on doors trying to get an agent. And before too very long, uh, a matter of months, I found myself on a soundstage acting in a movie. And I thought, wow, here I am. There's a camera, the sound department, costume, makeup sets, crew, I thought, wow, I'm in a movie, it's great. I thought this is going to rocket me to start. And uh, to this day, I can't quite figure out why it didn't quite work out that way. It was called a wonderful project called Zombies of the Stratosphere. <laughs> <laughs> revolvers and announced we're going to take over Earth. <laughs> that 
that's me. <laughs> and that job was followed by another great hit, Attack of the Brain Eaters. <laughs> that was my second job. So my career looked like it was quickly swirling around the drain hole and going down the drain. I went to work at various jobs. I sold life insurance, I sold vacuum cleaners, I worked in an ice cream parlor, I, I serviced fish tanks in people's homes and doctors' offices. Here comes the fish doctor, they used to say. I heard that too many times. And then I found a two-year job in the United States Army. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was standing in front of a desk, a corporal sitting behind the desk at a typewriter. You remember typewriters? <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, what are you doing in civilian life? I said, I'm an actor. And he said, oh, tell me what I might have seen you in. <laughs> <laughs> Zombies of the stratosphere. <laughs> click, 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 click. Infantry, okay. <laughs> I came out of the Army two years later. By that time, I was married. I had a child. I had another one on the way, and I had to go to work immediately to produce some income you know, before I could um, get my acting career going again. And uh, one night, I was driving a taxi in West Los Angeles. I took a job in cab driving. And I got a call to go pick up Mr. Kennedy at the Bel Air Hotel. And being from Massachusetts, the Kennedy name meant something to me. It was 1956. And uh, the man that came out to get into my cab was Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. And uh, he was not known nationally. Later that year, he made a, 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 an important speech at the Democratic Convention. He got some national attention. But when he stepped into my cab, hardly anybody knew him in California. And I said, how are things in Massachusetts, Senator? And he got, he, he was interested. Oh, it's great, somebody recognized him. Are you from Massachusetts? Yes. Where? Boston. Where in Boston? I said, the, the West End. He knew the area very well. He had a, an office just about two or three blocks from where I lived. On Be he was on Beacon Hill. And uh, he said, what are you doing out here? And here I am driving the taxi. <laughs> I said, I'm an actor. <laughs> <laughs> he said, a lot of competition in your business. I said, yes. He said, just like mine. <laughs> Keep in mind, he said, there's always room for one more good one. And I took that in and held on to it. It meant a lot to me, but keep that in mind. Four years later, he was elected president, and three years after that, he was gone. Anyway, uh, these are great memories, and I, I hold them dearly. I, I was invited to come out to Republic Studios for, an audit, for a, 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 a meeting with a producer, and he said, do you ride? And I said, no, not a car. He said, do you ride? Of course, we do westerns. Well, I made a mistake. I hadn't learned yet. I said, no, I don't write. I said, you better learn because we do Westerns. I've learned very quickly that when you're an actor and you go on audition, whatever they ask you, can you do, you say yes. <laughs> can you drop off a ship like a hundred feet into the water and swim 300 yards, kill a shark, and climb back on the ship? Yes. <laughs> done it. Done it many times. <laughs> I learned to ride, I worked in Gunsmoke, I worked in Wagon Train, I worked in Rawhide with Clint Eastwood, I worked in Bonanza. That's the army. The kid in the army, yeah. Cowboy Shatner? I don't think so. <laughs> and look, Jimmy Doohan is a laughing Indian? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know, anyway, that's... There I am, I, I, I did a lot of them. I, I played some bad Indians. I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't think I did them badly. They were bad people, you know. I played Indians so bad, Indians wouldn't play them. <laughs> anyway, there was, there was a way of learning, a way of making a living, and and then in 1960, 